Vienna, fin de siècle. The thriving urban center of the Habsburg Empire bore within its recently redeveloped fortifications great technological changes. Streets were illuminated since 1893 with electric lights, and pedestrians could swap their carriage tickets for ones bought aboard the tramway, circulating only recently around the Ringstrasse. Modernity permeated Viennese streets and symbolized a new urbanist lifestyle, liberal, bourgeois, in movement. Technology and functionality were dignified for their ability to organize the modern person's life, and any references to the nostalgic past were pointed out by the new generation of artists. Hoffmann, Moser, Eulbrich, Klimt, Die Jugend gegen die Alte, The Young versus the Old. Breaking from historicist and outdated forms, these artists tinted their works with fresher designs, decorative and evocative of natural form. In fact, the Wiener Werkstätte often took direct inspiration from children's art in the Jugendkunstklasse of educational reformist Frank Tizek. Just as architecture and streets are the result of the philosophies and practices of their time, the concept of childhood is imbued with social, political and cultural specificities. It responds to new methods of production and to cultural aspirations, to changing urban lifestyles and to market demands. The concept of childhood, as opposed to its experience by actual children, is hence a reflection of the constructors. It is constructed by, and very often for, adults and artists. Well, in that case, what influence did the secession have on the production of modern childhood and toys? First, a quick history of childhood. Children were seen and treated very differently throughout history. They were successively considered as miniature adults, to nay like primitive beasts, before the enlightenment of the 18th century. And toys and objects which were made exclusively for the child's play and edification didn't exist, or were only accessible to the royalty. Play was considered as sinful, as an obstruction to learning. Childhood was a stage in human development to be passed as quickly as possible. Indeed, whilst dolls and other playthings were reserved for spiritual and religious rituals, efforts were made to make young infants stand up and walk as early as possible. Only in the 18th century did things begin to change. In his thoughts concerning education, John Locke described the child's mind as bare upon birth, a tabula rasa which would become perfectible for knowledge and the environment. Children were now these innocent angels, free of sin and reason, who required protection and time to develop at their own pace before slipping downwards to adulthood. Toys then gained moralistic and educational functions. His early log blocks, for instance, helped children understand the spatial relationships between parts and their whole in simpler, more playful forms than the previously stiff and miniaturized standing chairs. In the same vein of playing with geometrically shaped blocks, the Ankerstein Baukasten building set, first designed by the Lilienthal brothers in Germany in the 1880s, quickly became one of the most popular construction toys in Europe. It gave children the freedom to create new building forms from real looking blocks, imitating blue slate, yellow limestone and red brick. They could be rearranged at will, similar to the Lego system. The blocks tended to favor Gothic and Romanesque buildings, castles and fortresses of a German past. Koloman Moser exhibited at the 1908 Kunstschau in Vienna, his Die Stadt building set, which he designed in 1906. Here, the artist and co-founder of the Wiener Werkstätte doesn't favor any particular style, nor does he provide guidelines or instructions on how to build a set, leaving the child and the adult complete freedom of play. He infuses his toy with modernist principles, free from any historicist elements. Handmade and made in wood, Moser simplifies the construction toy and rejects the overly complicated factory toy, such as the anchor blocks and the famous penny toys or tin toys, instead taking inspiration from folk and peasant toys, or Provinzkunst, manufactured in the neighboring regions.
The patriotic interest in local histories, folklore, and a simpler pastoral life grew in line with a growing industrialization and commercialization within the Habsburg Empire and the larger phenomenon of primitivism in Europe. Germanic regions like the Grodnatal and the Erzgebirg were entirely devoted to the toy industry, producing over 60% of the global toy market at the turn of the century, and still produce a wide array of wooden toys today. Peasant toys were described as free from the corruption and culture that inhabited the growing urbanist population, and was often compared to the tabula rasa mindset of a child. This conflation between rural communities and children, although infantilizing the peasants, greatly inspired the Jugen spirits of the secession and the Wiener Werkstätte to collect these objects and appropriate both the thematic and craft of folkloric art. The secession's toys opted for even simpler geometric forms, devoid of complex machinery, technical details, or sometimes even limbs, as it was thought that mechanized toys would quickly bore the child, prefabricating its playtime. Secessionist toys, produced by both female and male artists, were carved and painted by hand. The toys may have had some imperfections, but this put emphasis on the material quality and wholeness of the wood, on their uniqueness and modernity, and children would use them according to their own imagination. They were also relatively gender neutral. Take for instance Magna Mautner Markov's 1908 dollhouse, compared to a typical German kitchen toy. There are no kitchens, no gadgets, and no duties to do in the house. Markov pays minimal emphasis on the conditioning of girls as future housewives, which wasn't the case in prior days, wherein dolls were fabricated to look like realistic babies. Moreover, the Kunstschau's ideology of the Gesamtkunstwerk transpires in her dollhouse. Although its simple wooden structure takes inspiration from traditional peasant toys, the functional design and checkerboard patterns here reflect the Viennese 1900 style, bringing art to the nursery. It can be argued, however, that the simple forms admired by the secessionists were in fact the result of an exploited rural labour, now under pressure to produce more than half of a global toy market, in a context of industrialization and trade with large urban areas. Moreover, the visual appropriation of folkloric art by Viennese artists and elite consumers in search of a new way of subverting post-Renaissance aesthetics can be questioned, as they infantilize the more marginalized communities of the empire. Emis Weber Pochaska argued that the best toys are made by children or people who work like children, half playing, half dreaming. Artists and peasants hit the true childlike note. This seemingly bottom up approach of designing Kunst für die Kinder, art for the children, reveals the paradox of modernity. Whilst the creative spirits of children are liberated through toys created by Moser, Halflinger, and Weber Pochaska, Whilst they are sanctified as purified pre-adults, free-willed and innocent, their perceptions of what may be good or bad design are dominated by functionalist philosophies from a very early age. The childhood is hence being constructed as part of a modernist cultural project of establishing the modern subject, empowered, autonomous, unique, and yet disciplined and dominated under specific cultural needs and rules of the epoch. Needless to say, the condition of modern childhood owes a lot to Viennese modern artists.